Welcome to the second official uh, Fertility Forum, Riches Bay. And uh, I will now give over to, to Dr. Kubis Kutsia from Vitalab KZN. He's the medical director there. He's completed his uh, certificate in reproductive medicine in 2012 already. And he's been specializing in the area ever since. All right, Dr. Kutsia. Thank you. Thanks so much, Gotti. <clears throat> and thanks, everybody, for joining us uh, in this uh, different times and we are very delighted that uh, Fering uh, did not uh, say they do not have money to help us with this uh, fertility forum. Um, this is the second year they are sponsoring this event and uh, we would like to thank them. The first speaker for tonight and that's Dr. Yossi Unterslag and we are very happy to ask him to talk on recurrent pregnancy losses which he is very passionate about. So over to you, Yossi. Thank you, Kervis. Thank you for the uh, introduction. It's really a, a great honor to, to present tonight to you guys. Um, and I look forward to COVID being away and being able to spend more time in KZN so that we can uh, meet a few of the specialists that side of the world in person. Um, tonight, I'm going to be speaking on some Thing, as Dr. as Kovis has said, is a big passion of mine, which is um, the prevention of recurrent pregnancy losses. Um, and um, I'm going to give a, 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 a talk which kind of is on two levels. One on a on a on a lighter level, where you know we'll speak about pretty common things, and then we'll go a little bit deeper into the the, the options available from a from a reproductive medicine point of view. Yeah, to be able to manage patients with recurrent pregnancy losses. But very much I'd like to kind of um, speak more to the generalist because we are speaking to generalists and just recap um, the causes of recurrent pregnancy losses and um, obviously to go into what kind of options we have available to treat these patients. So the first thing we start off with obviously is what is the definition of a person who is a recurrent aborto or somebody who has recurrent pregnancy losses. And this is really where the problem starts because there are many definitions for who is a recurrent aborto. And um, one of the definitions will say two or more failed clinical pregnancies, which is documented by ultrasound or histopathological examination. And then there's another definition which will say three consecutive pregnancy losses, which are not required to be intrauterine. So these can include ectopic pregnancies. And there's, there's many different de definitions. And interestingly, lots of societies around the world have chosen um, different, uh, different definitions for who is the recurrent aborto and who is the person who is, um, needs to be managed as a recurrent pregnancy loss patient. And obviously, if we struggle already with the definition, then obviously um, we struggle to, to marry all the different associations with when do we start investigating these patients and when do we start treating these patients? And I'm going to try and kind of give really what's my opinion, um, but also back that up with as much evidence as possible. So this is an incredibly interesting slide to me always. Um, and that is if we think about a pregnancy starting off, only about 30% of pregnancies that begin with conception will result in a live birth. And a lot of these pregnancies are lost before women will even know that she's pregnant. So we call these preclinical losses, and about 30% of pregnancies will be lost pre-implantation. Then about 30% of those pregnancies that continue will be lost post-implantation, but this is preclinical. So we don't yet know really that this person is pregnant. Probably they haven't done a pregnancy test, possibly they haven't missed the period. But of the pregnancies that reach clinical pregnancies, about 10% of them result in miscarriage and about 30% of them result in live birth. And this is an incredibly important slide, I think, that we use when we counsel patients who are having their first miscarriage or maybe even their second, that it is much more common than, we, than, than the layman out there thinks it is. Just to go a little bit further into the definition, so we have um, primary recurrent supporters or patients who are primary recurrent pregnancy loss patients and those who are secondary recurrent pregnancy loss patients. And the difference here is that the primary patient refers to a pregnancy loss in a woman who has had a pregnancy 
past five. And a second recurrent, secondary recurrent pregnancy loss will refer to somebody who has never had a pregnancy, who has had, sorry, who has had a pregnancy go to viability, result in a live birth, and then um, they then present with three or more miscarriages in a row, depending on which definition we go by. And obviously, this is quite important because the way we we approach these patients does differ whether somebody has ever had a pregnancy to viability or whether they've never had a pregnancy to viability. So looking at the incidence of miscarriages, so in a first pregnancy, so this is a primary patient, we would say their risk of miscarriage is between 11 and 13%. Once a woman has had one miscarriage though, that risk increases slightly to somewhere between 14 and 21%. Once a woman has had two miscarriages, you'll see that her risk increases again to 24 to 29%. And after three miscarriages, up to 31, between 31 and 33%. And this is where the, the different societies differ with their definition because where, where do we draw the line here and say, right, this person has now reached a point where she's got a significant enough risk to, re to require a workup. So when do we we start investigating, investigating patients with recurrent pregnancy losses. And again, like I said, this is difficult to define because there are differing definitions on who is the recurrent aborter. But studies have found that women with three or more consecutive pregnancy losses prior to 12 weeks, irrespective of whether the pregnancy was seen on ultrasound or not, have a significantly reduced prognosis in their fourth pregnancy. And I've shown that in the previous slide. And so a lot of the societies will say, we must wait for a woman to have three miscarriages in a row before we start investigating. Um, but there's no real clear guideline on when to investigate. And the next line is really something. Now, I always think to myself, is it, is, is it acceptable to allow a patient to suffer three miscarriages in a row before we start investigating? And we all know what a significant impact a miscarriage has on a woman and a couple emotionally. Um, and so, in my opinion, I don't think we should be waiting for three miscarriages to start investigating a person. And I'm going to show you in the next few slides why I believe that's the case. So, we know that the, the cause of the first miscarriage will greatly affect the incidence of, the of, of, of miscarriage in the subsequent pregnancy. And this is why I believe it's important to start investigating our couples a little earlier. Because if they have a genetic mutation in one of the parents, which has caused the first miscarriage, then we know that their risk of miscarrying in the subsequent pregnancies is extremely high. If a woman miscarriages due to uterine abnormality, then we know that the risk of her miscarrying in a subsequent pregnancy, again, is high. But if a miscarriage is related to a sporadic chromosomal abnormality, we know that in a young woman, it's unlikely for this to happen again. In an older woman, it's more likely for it to happen again. And so we know that if it's a sporadic chromosomal abnormality, like a monosomy X, for example, it's unlikely to happen again. And so we can reassure our patient and say, right, go ahead and get pregnant again. But if our patient is miscarrying because her or her husband carries a balanced translocation, well, then we need to be more active in helping them achieve uh, ongoing pregnancy. When we look at age and its uh, relation to miscarriage, we, there's an excellent mm. study which looked at um, the, the incidence of miscarriage across differing age groups. We know that the overall rate of spontaneous miscarriage was at, is at about 11%, but you'll see how really? age oh. makes such a big okay. difference. So in a woman between the ages of 20 and 30 yeah. years old, we would say her risk of miscarriage is somewhere between 9 and 17%. Once a woman is 35 years old, that, mis that risk increases to 20%. And in our group of patients that are 40, up to 40%, and those that are 45 and older have a much higher chance of losing their pregnancy than taking this pregnancies to term. So again, we need to look at a woman's age when we decide how deeply do we go and investigate the cause of this miscarriage. In a 45-year-old who's miscarried, we can accept that this is an age-related risk. But in a younger person who's got a much lower risk of miscarrying, well, then we want to go into this pregnancy a little bit deeper and say, is there something here that we can do to prevent this happening again? So just very briefly, when we look at our causes of miscarriages, um, I'm going to go through a few of the common causes of miscarriages and discuss them 
discuss them briefly. So let's start with the uterus. It's an easy organ for us to investigate because we're all good at ultrasound. And ultrasound is incredibly useful in picking up a lot of these pathologies. And so let's start with the easy, the easy place to start investigating, and let's look at uterine abnormalities. So it's responsible for somewhere between 10 and 50% of losses. And the uterine septum is the most common cause of miscarriage in this group of patients, and it makes up about 60% of the pregnancy losses. We also know that fibroids can cause miscarriages depending on their position, and we'll discuss that a little bit. And then the point number three over here, which is uterine scars or synechia, which is also a very interesting thing because I see a lot of patients who have a first miscarriage, that miscarriage is managed surgically, which results in an Asherman syndrome. And then they have a second and a third and a fourth miscarriage related to the Asherman syndrome. And again, this is something that can be picked up post miscarriage and be managed so that we could prevent the next miscarriage happening again. And I'm not going to go much into the incompetent cervix because that relates much more to second trimester losses, which we're not going to concentrate on tonight. So congenital abnormality we know are not always associated with miscarriage. So you've got your unicornates, your bicornate, your diadelphus uteruses, and these uteruses, um, although they're abnormal, they don't tend to give early first trimester recurrent miscarriages. As opposed to the patient who's got a significant septate uterus, these patients are the ones who present with recurrent miscarriages. And also our patients with T-shaped uteruses, infantile uteruses, etc., they are the ones who present with recurrent miscarriages. Uterine fibroids, like I said, not always a cause of miscarriage, depending on their position. We know that those that are closer to the endometrium or the junctional zone of the uterus, they are more common to cause, they're more likely to cause miscarriages compared to the the, the subserosal fibroid or the pedunculated fibroid or even the intramural fibroid that's quite far away from the um, endometrium in the junctional zone. And there are a lot of hypotheses of why fibroids cause miscarriage. And we know that the endometrium and the junctional zone surrounding the fibroid have abnormal receptors. Um, you get abnormal uterine contractions in the uterus. And these are the things that contribute to miscarriages in women who have fibroids in or around the uterine cavity. Like I said, we've got our patients with uterine synechia or Asherman syndrome. And again, I want to stress that these patients are patients that we often see um, who have a first miscarriage and then second, third, fourth miscarriage. And when we examine these patients, they've got significantly scarred uteruses. And very likely, if this had been managed after the first miscarriage, then they would have and not have to have suffered through a second and a third and a fourth miscarriage. And again, just to go back, these are all abnormalities that we can pick up on a routine ultrasound. If we scan a patient mid-cycle and her endometrium is thin or irregular, suspect uterine synechia. We can always see scar, we can always see fibroids in the uterus, irrespective of where a woman is in her cycle. And obviously congenital abnormalities of the uterus slightly more difficult to pick up on ultrasound, but a good comprehensive ultrasound of the uterus can pick up whether there are uterine factors contributing to the woman's miscarriages. Briefly to touch on the immunological factors of miscarriage, so we know that there's several immunological conditions that are thought to play a role in recurring miscarriages, but we know that the most common one that we see is antiphospholipid syndrome, and one of the diagnostic clinical diagnostic criteria of antiphospholipid syndrome, we know, is miscarriage. And so there's a strong link between those patients who are antiphospholipid positive and recurrent abortion, and the patients who present with recurrent miscarriages. And this makes up about 5 to 15% of our patients with recurrent pregnancy losses, um, and that's antiphospholipid syndrome. Briefly to touch on endocrine disorders, we know the role of poorly controlled diabetes and its contribution to early pregnancy losses although more likely related to congenital abnormalities and late complications in the pregnancy. Women with PCOS, we know, are far higher than, carry a far higher risk to miscarry than the general population, and their risk of miscarriage is somewhere between 20 and 40 percent. And there's, again, lots of theories as to 
why women with PCOS are more prone to miscarriage, and is this related to poor air quality? Is this related to abnormal receptor uptake in the in the endometrium because of the chronic estrogen um, um, on the uterus? Um, but we know that there are studies that have suggested that treating these patients with metformin does reduce the mis risk of miscarriage. But um, more recent studies, well-designed studies, have shown it actually to often no real improvement in the outcome of patients with um, PCOS um, in preventing them from recurrent pregnancy losses. Um, poorly controlled thyroid dysfunction, either overactive or underactive thyroid, apologies for the typo there, has been linked with both infertility and recurrent pregnancy losses. Increased levels of prolactin um, being linked with recurrent miscarriage. The next point I think is very important, and that's luteal phase deficiency. Now, this is um, one of the topics that really, um, you know, uh, um, I've paid a lot of attention to and done a lot of reading around. And I think the most important committee opinion, which was released in 2015 by the American Society of Reproductive Medicine, uh, and they commented that there is no reproducible, pathophysiologically relevant and clinically practical standards to diagnose luteal phase deficiency or to distinguish them the fertile from the infertile woman. And there is no good evidence to suggest that testing for and treating luteal phase deficiency will improve the outcome in patients with recurrent pregnancy loss. And I think this is very important because as gynecologists, when we see a patient who's had a miscarriage, our first port of call is to whip out the uterogestin or the cyclogestin in the next pregnancy and to treat her with cyclogestin or uterogestin. Or what we'll do is we'll monitor the beta HCGs and we'll monitor the, pro the, the progesterone. And as soon as we see that progesterone coming down, we will suddenly start to supplement the progesterone. But what we know today is that that progesterone will come down as a result of a failing pregnancy. And it's not that the dropping progesterone will cause the miscarriage. And so to treat these patients with progesterone, more likely than not, delays the inevitable, but it doesn't change the long-term outcome for these patients. Genetic factors is very, very important. We know that abnormalities in the number of chromosomes of the conceptus is by far the most common cause of sporadic miscarriages. And it accounts to up to 50% of losses. And obviously, the older the woman, the more common this is. Having one chromosomally abnormal spontaneous conception appeared to increase the risk of subsequent losses associated with chromosomal abnormalities, although very slightly. And the frequency of an abnormal carrier type in a second abortus after a first aneuploid or euploid abortus was 70% versus 20%. So just to explain what that means. That means that in a woman who's miscarriage, in her second miscarriage, if the first miscarriage was related to aneuploidy, abnormal number of chromosomes, the, the incidence of it happening again in the second pregnancy was 70%. Where? Whereas, if a woman had a miscarriage, her first miscarriage was um, studied and found to have a normal number of chromosomes, her risk of miscarrying um, due, to gen due to a chromosomal abnormality in her second miscarriage was only 20%. So the fact that she's had one chromosomally abnormal pregnancy that led to a miscarriage certainly increases the risk of her second pregnancy being chromosomally abnormal as well. I'm going to go back into genetic factors in detail. So. Um, so we'll speak a little bit more about that. Um, there we go. Um, inherited clotting disorders. Again, another very big bugbear of mine when we get to, uh, when we talk about recurrent miscarriages, because there's a real large body of contradictory literature um, discussing the association, the association between maternal inherited thrombophilias and recurrent spontaneous abortion. But if we really look deep down in this body of evidence, um, the reality is that it seems to suggest that treatment with anticoagulation does not improve the outcomes of women with recurrent pregnancy loss, even in the presence of an inherited thrombophilia. Again, what do we do? We see our patients who have miscarriages, we give them progesterone, we give them plexate. And this, the literature does not support this, and I think it's important that we remember that um, when we when we give the medication, and we all do, but it's, it's important to uh, discuss this with the patient that there is not good evidence to support this, but we still use it in a, a lot of our cases. The question we all 
or get asked by our patients, does stress play a role? And there is no high quality evidence which shows a relationship between recurring pregnancy loss and occupational factors, stress, or low level exposures to environmental chemicals. I think this is important because these are the questions we get asked. Was I exposed to something which caused my miscarriage? Was my work stress too high, which caused my miscarriage? Is there something that I could have done to, to change this? And there really is no high quality evidence to show that any of these factors causes recurrent miscarriages. That being said, there is an interesting study which comes out of the UK, which looked at patients with recurrent abortions, and they, they separated these two groups of patients into two arms. One where they treated them with lots of add-ons, progesterone, kexa, and ecotrin, and then routine monthly scanning. And then another group of patients who they treated with the same intervention, plus weekly ultrasound scans. And they found that the group with weekly ultrasound scans seemed to have a slightly better pregnancy outcome. And so that study suggests that keeping your patient's brain calm may improve the outcome of her pregnancy. To touch a little bit on this new concept, which I like to call the super fertile uterus. So we know some women with recurrent miscarriages may have this uterus which is allowing abnormal embryos to implant inappropriately. So if we go back to the first slide that I showed, the inverted triangle, and we look at how many pregnancies that come about where fertilization happens but don't reach a viable conception, what happens to these pregnancies? So the sperm will meet the egg in the fallopian tube, the egg will be fertilized, the embryo will travel along the fallopian tube, and it will arrive in the uterus. And when it arrives in the uterus, it gets sensed that this is an abnormal embryo. It's a noisy embryo. It's trying to repair itself. And the uterus will not allow this embryo to implant. And so there's some filtration that happens at the endometrium level, which doesn't allow an abnormal embryo to implant. However, we seem to see a group of patients who every time they have unprotected intercourse around ovulation, they fall pregnant. Occasionally, that pregnancy will go to term and viability, but most of those pregnancies she tends to miss. And it's an important thing, it's an important concept to know, although this has to be a diagnosis by exclusion, when we've excluded all other causes of miscarriage, it's important for us to know that this concept exists because these patients have a very good prognosis. If they keep trying, they will eventually ovulate with a good quality egg that leads to a good normal embryo and allows for an ongoing pregnancy. The problem with this is that these patients often land up becoming incredibly emotionally scarred and we also run the risk of recurrent DNT causing damage to her endometrium. So important to know about this concept and to keep an eye out for, for these kind of patients. So like I said, who would we diagnose with the super fertile uterus? And I think, yeah, it's important for us to document the cause of the miscarriage with testing the products of conception. And I'm going to talk about this a little bit more because if we test an embryo and it's chromosomally abnormal, we know we can stop our work up here. No matter how normal the uterus was, no matter how good the hormones were, this pregnancy would not have continued to grow. But if the pregnancy is euploid, chromosomally be normal, then we know we need to start looking for other causes of miscarriages. And in a patient who has recurrent aneuploid miscarriages, these are the patients who we should consider to be those with a super fertile uterus. But again, important not to get tunnel vision, not to say, right, um, you'll be fine, just keep trying. And in the end of the day, this one of, this, one of the couples, either the male or female, have a balanced transportation, and it's incredibly unlikely for them to land up with a, with, a, with, a, with a viable concept. So what is the role of pre-implantation genetic screening in an IVF? And um, what is specifically is its role to us, pre-implantation genetic screening of embryos in the prevention of recurrent miscarriage? So there's a really great table that sits here on the left-hand side, left side of my slide, which shows that as a woman's eggs age, so does her fertility reduce. But as a woman's eggs age, so does her increased risk of miscarriage increase. And what this shows us is that the older the eggs get, the, the lower the chance they have of resulting in a normal pregnancy. And if a pregnancy does occur, the 
higher the risk there is of this pregnancy miscarriage. And this increase in maternal age has a very parallel increase in um, chromosomal aneuploidy in the pregnancies that these patients um, have. This is a really nice table which shows um, uh, the, these are embryos that were genetically tested from all different age groups. So we've got our patients who fall into the really young group. These are the young girls who donate their eggs to couples who are already um, unable to conceive with their own eggs. And then we look at our group of patients under 35, those 35 to 37, 38 to 34, 41 to 42, and then those older than 42. And I think it's really important to note the, gray, the, the green and the blue columns on these slides. In a young woman, a young woman, these are women who donate their About 54% of her embryos are genetically normal. And the other embryos, being genetically abnormal, have the risk of miscarriage. As the woman's eggs age, you will see that the green line decreases significantly. So the number of normal embryos decreases significantly, and the number of abnormal embryos increases significantly. So again, this indicating to us the importance of egg age and chromosomally euploid or chromosomally normal pregnancies. And this is very important because it helps us to, to counsel our patients, it helps us to guide our patients, and it also helps us to manage our patients' expectations of what her chances are of having an embryo that's chromosomally normal and the older her eggs get. I think I just lost my slides. Can you all see my slides still? I don't think yes, yeah, it's still the one with the okay. Oh, so okay, all right, all right. So what again? What is the role of pre-implantation genetic screening in IVF? So we know that um, the leading IV cause of IVF failure is aneuploidy, but also, um, when we go and do IVF and transfer genetically abnormal embryos, these genetically abnormal embryos will either fail to implant or they will result in a miscarriage. So in our patients who have recurrent pregnancy losses related to chromosomal abnormalities in their embryos. What we can offer them is IVF, genetic testing of the embryos, and then the ability to transfer a genetically normal embryo into the, the uterus, thereby um, improving her, um, her pregnancy outcome. And it's being able to genetically test the embryos has really changed our ability to treat women with recurrent miscarriages because what we had previously was we would fertilize the eggs, we would grow them to be embryos, and then, then we would look down the microscope at the embryo and we would say, right, this embryo looks like the best, we're going to put this one back. But what we've learned since we've been able to genetically test embryos that is that an embryo can be equally as good and be abnormal. And here you see three embryos, all really high quality, high grade embryos, of which one is genetically normal normal and the other two are chromosomally and in a patient who is a recurrent abort and has recurrent miscarriages um, we need to know the, the chromosomal makeup of the embryo because if her miscarriages are as a result of genetic abnormalities chromosomal abnormalities we need to put the chromosomally normal embryo back in her uterus for her to have an ongoing pregnancy and so today we have the ability to genetically test the embryo this has come a long way in the old days, we used to biopsy day three embryos, and we knew that this would negatively affect the embryo's ability to implant. We also were limited with how many chromosomes we could test. We had fish, which only looked at seven chromosomes, and we would miss the mosaic embryo. And so in the end of the day, we realized that day three biopsying of embryos was actually detrimental to the IVF outcome. And now two things have happened. Our laboratories have improved, and so we can grow our embryos to be day five embryos. And we can also now biopsy an embryo when it's divided into the trophectoderm and the inner cell mass. And so by removing just a few cells from the trophectoderm, it will not affect the inner cell mass and this embryo's ability to yield the normal pregnancy. And we can take these few cells from the trophectoderm. We can run next generation sequencing. We can look at all 22 copies of the chromosomes plus the sex chromosome. And we can say whether an embryo is genetically competent or not, chromosomally competent or not. Now, this is um, genetic results, PGS results, from a patient who presents 
with recurrent miscarriages. And what you'll notice from this is that this patient made many embryos, one, two, three, four, five, six embryos that this, this woman's eggs um, yielded. But only one of these embryos was chromosomally euploid. And so had she fallen pregnant with any of these other embryos, that would have resulted in a miscarriage. But the fact that we can now make embryos, genetically test them, and go directly to the one embryo that's euploid, chromosomally euploid, we immediately take away that genetic risk of that, that risk of miscarrying related to chromosomal abnormalities, and thereby we improve her take on baby rate significantly. Um, I'm going to skip this a little bit because people ask, don't um, want to damage an embryo to biopsy and freeze it. But essentially, this slide shows that biopsying and then freezing an embryo does not reduce the, the, the pregnancy rate. And there's good evidence to suggest now that actually our pregnancy rates from frozen embryos is actually better than our pregnancy rates from fresh embryos. So do we offer PGT or PGS, pre-implantation pre genetic testing, pre-implantation pre genetic screening for all of our patients? And the answer is definitely not. But you'll see that the biggest group of patients who benefit from um, genetic testing of the embryos are those with recurrent IVF and those with advanced maternal age and those with repeated miscarriages. And these are the patients who present to us with recurrent miscarriages very likely relate to recurrent chromosomally abnormal concept conception. So if we can test the embryos, we can improve their live birth rate significantly. So at the end of last year, a study came out called the STAR trial, which, which, which looked at um, compared Comparing single embryo transfers in embryos that were selected based purely on how they looked down a microscope versus embryos um, selected based on, on their genetic makeup, their chromosome. And the primary outcome of the study was ongoing pregnancy rates at 20 weeks of gestation. And the interesting thing is that when they looked at the two groups, they found that there was not much of a st statistically significant difference in the two groups of patients. But in a sub-analysis of, the, of, the, of, the, of the, the patients, they found that the group of patients between the ages of 35 and significantly benefited from selecting the embryos based on the genetics and not the morphology. The patients in the younger group, 25 to 34, there was not much of a difference in those patients' outcomes when we chose morphologically. And that makes perfect sense because we know the older the egg, the more likely to to make a chromosomally abnormal embryo. And so the, the older the egg, the more um, significant the outcomes that are improved by genetically testing the embryos beforehand. So I'd like to quickly just discuss the male because we've spoken a lot about the female. And the question is, does, male, does the male contribute to recurrent miscarriages? And what we know today is that sperm with a high DNA damage or high DNA fragment contributes to recurrent miscarriages. And we see this in our laboratory. We see patients who have high DNA fragmentation. The embryos that these guys make are all really poor quality embryos. And what causes DNA damage or DNA fragmentation in the sperm? And here's a, a, a really nice slide which indicates the possible causes of high DNA fragmentation in the sperm. So it's important that we know Men with high DNA fragmentation or damage to the sperm, to the DNA in the sperm, contribute to recurrent miscarriages. But what do we do about that? And that's the big question. Is there anything that we can do about this? So just looking at DNA fragmentation and IVF outcome, we know that sperm DNA fragmentation above 30% 30, 30 contributes to very poor embryo development and higher miscarriages rate, carriage rate. Sperm DNA fragmentation is an independent measure of sperm quality. And it may have a better diagnostic and prognostic capability than the current standard sperm parameters. So when we send them our male patients for a, for a sperm, what we essentially do is that sperm gets looked at and an analytical test is done. We look at the sperm, we count the sperm, we look at the morphology, we look at the motility, and we give a comment and we say everything looks fine. But what we're not doing is looking at the DNA integrity in the sperm. And we know that the DNA integrity of the sperm will significantly impact the 
embryos that we get and can cause recurrent miscarriages in these patients. So can we test for DNA fragmentation? We can. There are many diagnostic tests for DNA fragmentation, and those include the HALO test, sperm chromatome structures assays, the sperm chromatin dispersion test, and there's the tunnel assay, and then we've also got what we call the COMET assay, which is the single cell gel electrophoresis. The problem with these tests is that these tests tell us this is a guy with high DNA fragmentation. Fragmentation. But again, it doesn't tell us what we can do about it because all we know is that there's high DNA fragmentation, but we don't know how we can utilize this information. So we, there's a new technology, and the new technology is called MAX or magnetic cell sorting. And the first case report of a live, live born child with MAX was reported, as you can see. To, um, uh, sorry, I apologize, I left the date off here. But, um, 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 we, but just jump to the next slide, which is a bit more information. But so at the OC, I don't want to interrupt. I just want to give you a time frame. We're yeah. around uh, five to ten minutes to the time schedule. Right. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Scotty. I'm uh, really wrapping it up. If I can get my slides to move. Oh, there we go. So, what is Max? Max is magnetic activated cell sorting. And essentially, it's a sperm separation technique, which allows us to separate the sperm with apoptotic DNA um, from the sperm which have normal or non-apoptotic DNA. And essentially, what we do is we, we, we pass the sperm through um, a column, which has two magnetic magnets on either side. And as the sperm passes through the magnetic field, the sperm with high DNA fragmentation will be held back, and the sperm with low DNA fragmentation or normal DNA will pass through this column. And what benefit does this have to us? And the slide is very, very busy, but essentially what the slide shows, and it's a study that was, that's been conducted recently in our laboratory, and essentially it shows that men with DNA fragmentation, high DNA fragmentation, and um, prior to the max, once we've passed their, their, their sperm through max, had a significant reduction in the sperm with DNA fragmentation. And the column on the right shows the reduction in DNA fragmentation. So we now have a diagnostic and a therapeutic modality which enables us to select the sperm that has better DNA integrity, lower DNA fragmentation, and thereby possibly assist the couples who are having recurrent miscarriages related to sperm DNA fragmentation to yield better quality embryos and better ongoing pregnancy. Um, is there a therapeutic study there are many studies that have shown therapeutic benefits, and currently we have a scientist in our lab who's busy doing a therapeutic study in our lab.
Thank you. All right, so the, the next speaker is, is Dr. Chris Venter. Uh, and, uh, you know, when I think of Chris, I think of his passions. And when we, we caught a glimpse of his background on his laptop there, the photo of him cycling, and that's definitely a, a big passion of his. The other massive passion of his is fertility preservation for cancer patients. And, and Dr. Venter really has pioneered here at this field in South Africa, and he's really uh, collaborated with, an, with incredible units overseas, um, and, and he's really um, gone to the ends of the earth to make sure that he's been able to educate oncologists and educate the, the, the lay public, educate the GPs, the surgeons, and the gynecologists that there are um, fertility preservation options available to our young patients who are unfortunately diagnosed with cancer. So, Dr. Fenter, um, just to, to, to just obviously give you a, a, a massive thumbs up for the work you've done in this field, because I know of babies that have been born thanks to you pioneering um, the field of fertility preservation in South Africa. And, um, and I certainly know that there will be many more in the future because we are seeing more and more patients who are freezing their eggs and sperm before they have chemotherapy, thanks to the work that you've done to get the message out there. And so we look very forward to hearing your talk on fertility preservation. Well, thank you, Dr. Yossi, for that kind words. I don't know if you all can hear me. Um, Gotti? Yes, we can hear you loud and clear. Okay. And uh, just, uh, Gotti, I just want to thank uh, the uh, Faring Group as well, if, especially for this evening as well, but also for the support that you've been given on fertility in South Africa as well, and just uh, that you are a driving force. Again, the colleagues from us in, um, in Pangeni and Richards Bay, um, that area is very uh, close to my heart. I did my fellowship there at Nkwalazan and uh, still got very fond memories of that place. So, so yeah, thank you for this opportunity. Uh, just a few disclosures. Um, uh, we, um, I'm obviously working at Vita Lab in Johannesburg and I'm really excited to get involved in KZN as well. And again, I'm, I'm a board member of SASHWIC and we have um, a, t a teaching unit as well at the Twana University of Technology as well as the University of the Free State. We've got an affiliation there as well. Again, why is this important and close to my heart? Um, so I'm going to look at the indications tonight to see when can we offer a fertility preservation and then to ask the big question as to why and what have we learned in this sort of field as well. well once you offer these desperate patients some sort of light, I'd just like to look at again, the toxic effects of chemo and radiation therapy and just to share a few principles there as well. And then just look at the fertility preservation options that is available in South Africa. And then I would quickly just want to reflect on what is the current situation of oncofertility in South Africa. So again, as Dr. Yoshi um, illustrated very well in his, his brilliant talk, um, that we all know that a woman is born with X amount of eggs in her lifetime. So usually when they reach the age of about 12, they've got about 300,000 eggs left. And then as age progresses, then the egg numbers do decline. And as well as the egg numbers decline, we know that the egg quality also declines. And again, leading to a higher rate of abnormal embryos or abnormal pregnancies as well. So what does chemotherapy or radiation therapy do? It basically affects all of these primordial sort of germ cells as well. And it can cause DNA damage in these young cells and then sort of accelerate this um, egg um, aging process as well. And basically declining this woman's egg reserve completely or um, by uh, quite an extent. We know that if a woman, every sort of cycle of chemotherapy will, they will get, and we know usually they get about six cycles of chemotherapy, one of those cycles can accelerate the woman's egg reserve by one to three years as well. So if you get six cycles of chemotherapy in a certain um, form of chemotherapy, it can actually accelerate that woman's um, fertility by 18 years. So if a 20 year old patient presents to you, she can suddenly after chemotherapy now have the ovaries of a 38 year old woman. And I think that is important. What is equally important if you look at the slide as well is that as you can see, there's a declining of fertility and much later there is menopause. So most of the studies that has been performed in what the effect of chemotherapy is on a woman's fertility, they would look at the endpoint as menopause as the sort of the endpoint of fertility, but we know it's much earlier than that as well. So again, how do we measure egg reserve? I think I'll 
two best markers to use is our antral follicle count. We also got good ultrasound machines and just to, and I always look at this sort of um, slide as well, and just to use your antral follicle count and your AMH and just to try and put that in relation to each other as well. And just to determine prior to any sort of chemo or radiation therapy, where is the patient's current um, egg reserve? Again, so how does, how does it usually work when uh, patients are being referred to us? Again, the, the primary physician is the oncologist or the breast cancer surgeon or the hematologist. And they will always look at this patient to say, well, if the patient has a um, 70% or higher survival rate within the next five years, then this patient most likely is a candidate for fertility preservation. Again, then to ask the patient their needs as well. Have they completed their family and what are their wishes? And most of the oncologists, they do have oncology navigators, and usually these ladies will contact us um, via WhatsApp or via uh, our cell phones, and when we will expedite seeing these patients as soon as we can. And I'll refer to that a bit later on. Once we see these patients, then we will look at what is their fertility potential, and then just counsel them relating to what their current fertility pot uh, potential is and what sort of fertility preservations we can offer. And again, if it's not for everyone, if they do um, opt out, then we will also discuss the alternatives with them as well. So at the end of the day, that these patients make the informed consent on what, um, and also feel like they play a role in their future treatment and their future fertility. Again, what's the indications? And I think we, we talk about oncofertility, and this usually refers to when a patient has been diagnosed with a cancer. The most commonest cancers we see is your hematological, your leukemias, lymphomas. Uh, we get a lot of referrals from breast cancer patients and then from the surgeons as well, the colon cancer patients. Uh, the urologists, prior to any sort of intervention with the testicular cancers, they will usually refer patients then, the males, for, for sperm cryopreservation. Again, the hematologists, and, and as Dr. Yoshi has alluded to as well, as we're trying to spread the message and to try and raise awareness of what can the reproductive field offer these patients, we're starting to see a bit more uh, referrals from the hematologists as well. Again, for the general uh, gynecologists, and again, I, for 12 years, I was involved in general gynecology as well. And I, I know when we do operate these patients with the very severe endometriosis, you're dealing with an endometrioma, and then once you take out an endometrioma, sometimes you start, might see there's still a bit of normal ovarian tissue on that as well. What can you do with that tissue? And I think that's usually the answer as what we can offer as well. And then usually these patients with recurrent sort of mucinous cysts as well, we do need to accept the fact that re repeated surgeries do act, um, sort of harm a woman's um, fertility. It does harm a woman's sort of egg reserve as well. So every intervention can potentially affect the woman's chances to conceive uh, with her own eggs. Then again, what we've been seeing as well, and we've had some, um, a lot of the um, pr professional women that will usually come and come to us and say, well, they're 35 years of age, they are well established in their jobs, uh, starting with the family is not an option currently, and that they are aware that maybe they for later use as well, once they are ready to sort of start their family as well. So we call it social egg freezing, and we have um, have quite a, a few patients that we've been dealing in this way as well. And, and knowing as well, the, the technology is there, it can be used and it is successful. So we do offer that as well, not part of the oncofertility group, but just a service that is available. Now the question is always why fertility preservation? Why, what does it mean? And it's basically twofold as well. So. We know with the advances in cancer treatment, earlier detection and effective cancer sort of treatment, there's a much higher survival rate in, in these patients as well. A lot of them we know is in their reproductive years. Um, and we also have seen this um, trend in the younger cancer survivors as well, that with a survival rate um, increasing from 10 to about 90 percent as well. Equally so in the reproductive field, uh, there's been new advances in vitrification that we can now start offering to vitrify some of these patients' gametes as well. And again, this is a rapid expanding field. We know about 10 years ago this was not available, but as new developments um, come to the fore, we are able to start um, offering these services as well. In, if you look at the American Society of Clinical Oncologists as well as the European Society of Medical Oncologists, in their committee guidelines, it now states that any patient that undergoes 
um, cancer therapy needs to see a reproductive specialist if they are still in their reproductive years. So it's now almost taken up by law that to say these patients need to have the proper counseling prior to this, this treatment. Again, and there's good evidence that the fertility preservation gives hope to these um, desperate patients, and it does improve survivorship as well, maybe just giving them that, that ray of hope. Um, and again, like I said as well, to just note uh, and tell them as well, there is um, alternatives available, egg donation, surrogacy, adoption, or maybe just to accept um, their fate. Again, looking at gonadotoxicity and radiation treatment, what is the influence of um, gonadotoxic therapy on a patient? And this is usually just determined by the age of the patient, what type of chemotherapy is used and usually referring to the alkylating agents as the most damaging agents. If there's associated pelvic surgery, what cancer type and what's the staging of that as well. And we know these patients were usually with BRCA mutations and especially in, in boys as well, more than girls, that these patients are much more effective. So that's looking at the risk. I'm not going to go through the different sort of gonadotoxic sort of therapies as well, but just highlighting there the alkylating agents. But if you look at what the effect is, so how does this relate to what the effect on the patient's fertility is? And if you just look at the high risk sort of combinations, um, as you see that most of the evidence will show that more than 80% um, of these sort of six cycles can induce um, amenorrhea, and usually it might be in older women as well, but these combinations are harmful. So and to counsel the patients there as well. And as I alluded as well, they would refer to as amenorrhea, but knowingly much before then, there's a reduction in fertility. Again, when you look at radiation, what determines the damage done on the ovary, on a woman's egg reserve? And again, this has also been um, stipulated that the younger the patient, the better recovery that the patient will have. And again, the higher the doses of radiation, the more damaging that will be as well. So these are the factors that can determine the effect. So let's just look at the fertility preservation options. Now we're just looking at the females um, first. If we look at established sort of um, methods we can offer, we would first look at the oldest part of the family is the embryo cryopreservation. Um, then we look at oocyte cryopreservation. Uh, uh, during surgery that we can offer ovarian transposition. Um, and then I'm not going to talk much about the cervical cancers, but just offering then radical trachelectomy as well. So again, when you look at more experimental sort of um, methods, we will look at ovarian tissue cryopreservation and then testicular tissue cryopreservation. So, so this has been seen as experimental, but I'll allude to that as well. So as it start, we start doing this more, um, it is losing its experimental status. Again, when we look at uh, all this um, member of the family, looking at embryo cryopreservation, so from the late 90s, we started vitrifying day five blastocysts. Like Dr. Yoshi has said that these embryos do have a very good cryo survival rate of 98.5%. We have the added benefit of testing these embryos genetically as well to know exactly, and if it, uh, the patient asks you, doctor, what is waiting for me after my cancer therapy? Then you can tell them, well, there is two or three genetically normal embryos that we can transfer once you get a fertility break. Um, and again, in the patients, breast cancer patients with maybe BRCA1 or 2 mutations, we are able to test these embryos prior to transferring them to see if that offspring potentially might have one of these uh, the two gene mutations. So this is an established method, like I say, a good cryopreservation um, um, survival rate. Next question would be from an oncologist to say, but how is it going to affect our cancer therapy? And if we look at timelines, how much time do you need to preserve embryos? And again, it's just very important to, um, to say that, that this stimulating these patients, usually we would stimulate it for 10 to 12 days and then two days later do the pickup. These stimulations is not cycle related, so we don't need to wait for women's um, menstruation to start stimulation. We can start stimulation any, anywhere in the cycle. Again, if you look at the comparative studies, there's no difference in stimulating them during the luteal phase than stimulating them in the proliferative phase as well. So, so we would start and usually what we tell our oncologist is that we need 10 to 12 days to get the eggs or the embryos in, in the freezer. 
Again, just a small um, video just to show you about um, just our ex exciting field. I'm just going to speed it up a bit, but just a fertilized egg being fertilized and then how embryo development works. And again, like Dr. Yoshi said, once you see these embryos developing, um, to then to go and freeze them as well. Um, but that's the exciting yeah. field we are we are engaged in as well. So, and I always always think about it. Once you show the, uh, these pictures to patients in very desperate, and just to give them a bit of hope for the future as well, to show them the embryos, um, you can just see these patients, their the faces lighting up as well, and to say. Doctor, for for those 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 embryos, I will I will uh, go and do my best. So so it is hope um, for the patient that really needs that that positive feedback. Again, how does embryo cryopreservation works? And this is just a expanded blastocyst on your left. And then, as we can see, we would put it in a buffer, then in a cryoprotectant, and then we dip it um, and then put it in liquid nitrogen at minus 180 degrees Celsius. And what it basically does, it get, just go and shrink this embryo to its uh, shrinkage form. And again, once we want to warm it up, we just reverse that process. And it's almost, I would say it's like a sponge. Once you take the water out of it, it shrinks. And again, warming it up, it just absorbs the water and it starts re-expanding as well. And quite amazing to see that we can still, and like Dr. Yoshi has said, that at our frozen embryo transfers, we get better pregnancy right in our fresh cycles as well. So the, the second member of the family is our OSA cryopreservation. And just to give you a bit of history as well, from 2010, we um, got a new vitrification technique called rapid vitrification. Prior to that, the embryo uh, cryop um, survival rate was 2.5%. So that has increased now with the new cryopreservation and the ra rapid vitrification has increased to a cryo survival rate of up to 90% per oocyte. So again, how does this work? Again, a similar process, and just to show you how small these eggs are, it's almost half the size of a sand grain that we'll go and we would um, go and thaw them or sort of just uh, freeze them. And as you can see, these um, eggs, as they start shrinking prior to the cryopreservation sort of, um, sort of state as well. So we must accept this as well. We can only offer this to postpubertal females as well because we can only freeze mature eggs. So what does that mean? We need to stimulate these patients for 10 to 12 days to mature these preantral follicles and then to go and do a pickup and then to freeze these eggs as well. So it's only available for postpubertal females or females that's not in established relationship. We must also accept that we freeze these eggs at a very sensitive stage. And I'll show you just now at what stage we do freeze them. Next question that the patient will ask you, but doctor, what's the quality of my eggs? And, and again, this is being determined by three things. The one is, like we said before, Dr. Yoshi, the age of the patient as well. So we must accept that the older the patient, the high impact that age will have on the egg quality as well. The next thing would be is also a the vitrification technique. So we know that if we expose these eggs for longer than a minute to room temperature, that they can change its karyotyping. It can become an abnormal egg if it's handled in the wrong way. And I do think that's very important as well, that if we do refer our patients to a unit, that you need to make sure that that unit has a very good cryo survival rate and that that unit do has a very good pregnancy rate with their frozen frozen eggs as well. So again, we always say we want to give these patients hope, but we do not want to give false hope. So if you freeze 12 eggs of a patient, you do want, you do want to know that these eggs has not been damaged. Again, we freeze these eggs at a very sensitive stage during the metaphase two, and this is where you can see all the Chromosomes are lined on the equatorial plate, so really at a very sensitive stage. And again, this is slightly different than our embryos. We do believe our embryos are a much more stable sort of structure and that embryo cryopreservation is slightly better than air cryopreservation. And again, this has been shown by, I think, the leaders in the, the field as well, the COBA et al group from um, uh, EB Spain. And again, they have basically set the benchmark to say that the OSI cryopreservation preservation rate is 92.5%. If you look at their pregnancy rate, it compares um, and it is as good as their fresh eggs. And I think that's your benchmark as well, just to show that you can get a good pregnancy rate from your frozen eggs 
as good as your fresh cycles as well. Is this safe? And again, if you look at the literature reports that over 900 live births has been born from vitrified eggs, and this was a very um, older study, but again, that number has gone up as well. But that was the most recent sort of publication on safety of, of frozen eggs and pregnancies from that as well. Again, looking at our variant transposition, so I'm just going to talk a bit about our surgical options that we have for fertility cryopreservation. But usually, ovarian um, transposition is usually where someone would undergo radiation of the pelvic area as well. It can be offered to pre- and post-pubertal females as well, undergoing radiation therapy. We need to note the fact that uh, human oocytes are much more sensitive to radiation and chemotherapy as well. And um, again, the damaging effect on the egg is being determined by the radiation dose and the egg of the patient itself as well. And that uh, slide I've shown before. So um, just to show you as well, this is a patient. She was in her, I think she was around about 26 years of age. So she had a sarcoma of the pelvic region as well, and she was undergoing um, radiation therapy. So the radiation oncologist referred this patient and just showed me what sort of radiation field he's aiming at. And again, that gives an idea where we want to put the ovaries usually. Um, so, and again, in this patient, we wanted to put it on the iliac crest as well, just out of the radiation field of, um, out of the field of radiation. Again, what is the protective effect of ovarian transposition? And the literature would vary from 60 to 90 percent. So, why this big variation? So we do know when we, there is radiation, it can we can get scattering of these rays and it can potentially scatter towards more towards the ovary as well. So I think it's safe to tell your patient is about a 50% protective rate if you look at radiation of the pelvic area. It is done laparoscopically, but one point I want to make as well, and we've seen this as well, that by radiating the pelvis, we can also, the, the other structure that's there is the uterus. So by radiating a uterus, you can influence its vasculature as well as its elasticity, and then potentially reduce this, um, the, the vasculature to this uterus. The way we these patients will present is usually a bit, much smaller uterus and as well a much thinner endometrium as well. And we know if you look at the literature that these patients has been reported to have higher rate of implantation failure or higher rate of miscarriages, small for gestational age babies or stillbirths as well. And should that be the case? And the question is, when do we make that decision? And I think that's just by assessing that uterus, is to rather to refer this patient to consider a gestational carrier to carry um, the eggs. Again, I'm just going to show you a small uh, video. It's, um, I want to see if it plays. On a on this similar patient I was referring to as well, to um, she had polycystic ovaries as well, but just to to dissect it from the mesoopharium there as well, and then to mobilize this ovary loose from your fallopian tube. Just going to fast forward as well. That's a bit too quick, and then to use your infinitable pelvic where your um, arterial supply is coming from to create that sort of peritoneal window. And then just to go and fix this this ovary as well, so you, you don't you don't put at risk for torsion as well. Um, just going to fast forward as well in this patient. That's where we fixated it, and we did put up some clips there as well, just to guide the radiation oncologist as well as to where the position is of those those ovaries. Okay, radical trachelectomy. I'm not an um, oncologist, but I just looking at um, in early stage cancer that it can still be offered if that patient still want to use a uterus for a pregnancy to consider a radical trachelectomy. Just importantly, what I just want to add on as well, that these patients all need a abdominal circlage because of the competency of the cervix has been negatively affected. So what I would like to talk about, and again, as, as this field progresses, like we know our vitrification, we also know that um, the newest kit on, in the family is ovarian tissue cryopreservation. So if you look at the European countries, the, the Asian countries, as well as um, the, the states, the US, the experimental state, status of ovarian tissue cryopreservation has now been lifted. There has been over 160 a baby has been born out of ovarian tissue cryopreservation and reimplantation worldwide. One of them has been reported in South Africa. 
I think um, Dr. Yoshi is involved with a patient now. I think she might most likely be the second patient that, that will get a pregnancy after preserving her ovarian tissue. So we we're starting to move away from um, this being seen as an experimental status. So, so why is this now important? Because we must accept that all these previous methods I've um, alluded to was for post-pubertal females. So what about the pre-pubertal females, the young girls being diagnosed with lymphoma or leukemia? What do we do for them? Or even the ones that has uh, can cancer therapy uh, or has cancer and they don't have 10 to 12 days to use for a stimulation and we need to expedite the chemo chemotherapy. So then we can offer ovarian tissue cryopreservation um, again, I did stipulate it's still experimental, and if we do these procedures, we need some institutional re uh, review board um, approval just to have the consent of um, at least four um, of the, the specialists involved, and um, obviously very good counselling if it's a minor. With um, And again, counselling these patients as well, the, the parents to say it is still seen being experimental, but gen just showing them the overseas data as well. I think this slide is very important just to show as well, we all do surgeries, we do multiple surgeries on ovaries as well, but your your eggs, your ogonia and your preantral follicles, they lie in that outer one or two millimeters of your um, of your ovaries as well. In the, On the inside, that's your vasculature, that's your medulla, we, we're not interested in that part. So if we look at ovarian tissue cryopreservation, we will then go and take out a strip, sometimes it would be a whole ovary, and then we'll go and cut, cut it in these very fine uh, one millimeter strips, and that, that's the way we will go and sort of put it in the buffer media, put it in a cryoprotectant, and then um, store it in, in liquid nitrogen in sp special sort of devices. Again, um, has this been shown? And I'm not going to talk to you tonight about how the reimplantation works. I think that's a talk for another day in a bit more detail. Only got 20 minutes to do this, but but the question would be is about how effective is this? And there's been multiple studies as well. I think this was a very good study where they compared. And and I know one of um, my colleagues from France, um, they would do both ovarian as well as oocyte cryopreservation. Um, and looking at this trial as well, it was a prospective cohort study over a 10-year period where they looked at women with ovarian uh, oocyte vitrification versus ovarian tissue cryopreservation. And they looked at uh, the pregnancy outcome in these, these patients as well. I think the mean age was more or less the same. Again, it was utilized in 7% of the patients. And I think that's also important to know that we can store this as well. And patient will see this is a insurance they're taking out. It's never, we can never tell them this is a guarantee for a pregnancy one day. But just to tell them that at least this will give them a fairly good chance to make sure that they've done everything to preserve their fertility. But just looking at the pregnancy rate as well in the ovarian uh, oocyte vitrification group as well, the, there we had a 40%, they had a 40% pregnancy rate, and the ovarian tissue cryopreservation, they had a 33% pregnancy rate. What is important that 15% of these patients did conceive spontaneously, meaning that these ovarian strips was put in an autotopic space in the ovarian um, bed. And then these patients that ovulated spontaneously and that conceive, which, which is very promising. But basically just saying these methods are being proven and it is effective. Again, we also know that most of our oncologists, they will, um, and, and this is this is always been seen as a secondary as well. And if these fertility preservation options is not available or it cannot be offered for whatever reason, then all our patients will go on GnRH agonists. Again, these agonists basically blocks the uh, activity of the ovary and it stops this accelerated loss of uh, primordial follicles. So it does have a protective effect on these ovaries. The other advantage of giving a GnRH analogs in our patients undergoing cancer therapy, besides the protective effect, is also it stops the menstrual cycle, which we know um, chemotherapy can disrupt the ovarian activity. Again, just quickly looking at male fertility preservation, uh, and we know, and I, I always think this is a quite a, a depressing sort of stat as well, that um, in males there's a 50% lifetime risk to have cancer. So if you and your buddy have a beer, at least one of you, or might be both of you, might uh, have cancer one day. Again, that's just the most commonest cancers as well. 
But what I want to allude to as well, that if you look at men younger than the age of 19, they've got 85% five-year survival rate as well. And men younger than 75, 75% as well. So, so if you just look at that stat, I think most of these men will qualify to say, well, have you considered preserving your fertility? Again, just quickly showing just the anatomy of the testes as well with your um, tubulus seminiferi as well. And then that's been lined by your spermatogonium. And as the spermatogonia starts to sort of secrete the sperm, leading to the vas deferens. Again, what is the most affected area? And it's in this sort of basal layer of the tubulus seminiferi, and that's where our spermatogonia is lying. Like I said before, so how does cancer therapy affect fertility? Again, it's the direct effect of chemotherapy or the uh, effect of radiation therapy. There might be concomitant surgery as well. And some of these males do, do use some um, pain treatment, which can also suppress the gonadotrophins um, in the sperm production as well. Again, what, what is the effect or what will play a role in spermatogenesis and uh, the effect on the sperm um, Spermatogenesis process, again, the radiation shows um, the type of chemotherapy that's used. Um, again, what is the sperm count prior to sort of uh, cryopreserving a male sperm? And then we also know that if someone has cancer, that already can show up in his sperm count as well, and these males might, might already pr um, present with a lower semen analysis. The younger age group, yes, that's the group that most likely will recover um, best after the gonadotoxic sort of treatment. Again, what can we offer males to protect their um, fertility? Um, if they do get radiation therapy, yes, you can do a shielding of the testes. There's no currently no um, medication, medical therapy available to do spermatogenous suppressors, and there's very poor evidence to say it does work. But yeah, in general, men will just, in post people to men, they will go and give us a few samples with uh, masturbation. If that would fail, we would look at the lecture ejaculation. I'll just uh, show a slide on that as well. And then if all else fails, then to look at uh, doing a testicular sperm extraction as well. These are for post-pubertal men, and I'll just allude to the pre-pubertal young boys. What do we do for them? I think what is a very interesting um, stats, and this is coming from the US as well, that only in 50% of men that would undergo um, chemotherapy will be offered a to the option to bank this sperm. Maybe it was we, uh, they just forgot about it. I don't know. But, um, and then the next alarming thing is that 25% of these men will take up that offer as well. So, so again, it's, it's something that's not been offered and maybe we need to continue to raise awareness amongst this. And then ask the question is why will only 25% of men then take up the offer? How long does sperm take to recover after chemotherapy? We know sperm, the sperm count is at its lowest, six months after cancer treatment. Um, and usually it will return back to its sort of um, post-cancer treatment level. Um, and you can say to your patient, let's give it a year and then do your semen analysis. Then after two years, then to say, well, this is as good as it will get. What we would also recommend our patients is that a um, in most patients is that during this year of waiting, they should also just make sure they do not, um, they do take prevention as well, because if their partner do um, conceive, they've got a high risk of DNA fragmentation of that sperm and a high risk of a miscarriage, as Dr. Yoshi alluded to as well. Okay, so just to go back, I think I need to go a bit slightly quicker as well, just to show um, how much straws do we need. So usually we would say six straws is enough. One ejaculation, if it's a good count, will give us that sort of sample we can freeze. And we know we can also do these samples on a consecutive days as well. So it does not matter. Again, that's just to make sure that uh, oncologists, that we don't uh, waste, waste their times as well, and that we can start with chemotherapy as well. One thing we need to know as well that uh, the motility of sperm and then by freezing sperm, you can lose at least 50% of its um, sort, of, sort of numbers by um, just freezing it as well. Again, that's just a picture of electro ejaculation. That's one of the instruments you want to um, avoid in your lifetime, but just it does contract the pelvis um, and then leading to spontaneous ejaculation being done under general anesthesia. 
That's just an example of how a teaser would work, a small incision made in the test, also on the local, and then some sperm being removed as well. Just quickly on prepubertal boys, again, it's still been seen in South Africa as experimental, but we are seeing some referrals to us as well, where parents are well informed to say, but my little boy most likely want to know that I did the best for him as well. Can we be assisted? So we have done uh, two cases where we have done a sperm prior preservation with actually very good results, and that we did vitrify these testicular tissue in um, in a similar manner as we do with ovarian tissue. Again, what is the current status of oncofertility care in South Africa? And if you ask me this, and this was a slide that I produced in 2017, we didn't know where we were. And then just to try and to look at all our partners and say what who wants to get on board. We know we've got good fertility care in South Africa. There's 20 registered art units. We know we've got very good cancer care in South Africa as well. And the question is, how do we start sort of spreading the word and how do we start um, joining forces? Again, and that was the challenge as well, where we said, well, we need someone to guide us. And again, there was someone in the form of the Oncofertility Consortium in Chicago, which actually started to look at um, um, improving this sort of network worldwide. Again, if you look at this slide as well, um, in 2017, there was no flag in Africa. The first one was planted in Johannesburg in that year. And then one of, of my friends from Nigeria, George Aguena, planted one in Nigeria. And again, I'm happy to share with you tonight that we now have six centers and then we, what there is the newly one is now established in Durban as well. So, so this is a network. This network of partners do agree to uh, conform to the Oncofertility Consortium and their guidelines and the templates as well. So what does this involve? This involved that oncologists via the navigator would refer patients to a reproductive specialist. The timing of this should be within 48 hours. That's when contact should be made. The reproductive specialist will see and this patient will look at its current fertility and what is to be offered, and then either do it, um, the fertility duration option, and then as soon as possible, refer it back to the oncologist. So if you agree to um, sort of conform to or to become one of these centers, you need to conform to this and to conform to the standardization of your freezing technology as well, and just show you've got a very good freezing technology and you've got a good uh, cry survival rate. You also need to know that you need to label this and you need to keep keep that cry storage in, um, in, 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 in a standardized form, needing to make sure that these, um, that you still fill your dues um, in, in, um, in, in, in an adequate manner. And the last thing, just I just want to relate to two things more, is to say that this does involve legal documentation as well to tell us if maybe due to cancer or whatever reason um, the person would die off as well that there's good legal documentation to say what happens to his sperm or his eggs. Um, do we discard it or is there a directive to leave it for the, um, the partner as well? And last, last but not least is the cost. And again, there was the good news two weeks ago that uh, um, sort of discovery is going to start partially funding on certain um, sort of plans and start funding um, fertility. Um, and, and part of that discussion was to, to start looking into funding oncofertility as well. So, so we are in a very advanced stage in that sort of discussions as well. So I hope we can, in the next discussion next year, we can share some good news that Discovery or one of the other medical aids will start to help these patients in funding their cost as well. So um, I think I said everything. I thank you for your time and uh, a great privilege. And if, again, thank you for attending. Corpus Coutier is a, he qualified a year prior to me at the University of Pretoria. He's always, I've said it to him as well, he's, I always see him as the, the senior guy that he's always been an example for us as well. And we always looked up to him as well, literally and physically as well. So um, again, we are very, very excited to be in partnership with you, Scribus, as well, knowing your good name, knowing your high standards of medical care as well. And we are really excited to, um, to, to share our knowledge and to, to see each other as well. One thing Quivers did allude to as well is sometimes um, is, 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 there's his teamwork as well, and then every one of the team do add a bit, a bit to, to the team as well. I like Oncofertility, like Dr. Yoshi, the recurrent pregnancy losses, 
and I know Kurgus has, uh, except for his, his excellent surgical skills as well, he also is, is um, a very good reproductive doctor as well. So, Kurgus, yeah, I'm looking forward to your talk and your potpourri on fertility care. Thank you. Thank you, Chris, uh, for those kind words. Um, in preparing for this talk, um, I thought, now, what can I do to contribute to the area of fertility? And then I decided to look at referrals that we get to the clinic. And then I decided to uh, discuss a few things. And then decided on the name of Potpuri of fertility. And only afterwards went to the dictionary to see it's a mixture of dried petals and leaves from various flowers and plants. And it gives the room a pleasant smell. So. Um, hopefully, um, you'll all be awake after this, and uh, when referring patients, uh, we'll all have a very pleasant smell. The first thing I want to discuss is male fertility. Women should always come first, but I think the male is sometimes left behind. And uh, I'm just going to mention a few ways a man gets referred sometimes. Um, we get a referral where the female hasn't had any uh, previous examinations or tests done, but the poor man has had three sperm tests to make sure that he is okay, versus the other one where the male has not been tested because he had a baby 15 years ago and still believes that he do, does not have a problem. So it's very important to assess them as a couple because we know in 20% of cases, yes, it may, may be a male factor only, but up to 30 to 40% of cases, it will be where the male is a contributing factor. Just in terms of primary and secondary male infertility, it's also important to note that the evaluation is the same. And that's to start usually with a semen analysis, if that semen analysis comes back as abnormal, um, then we have to note a few things. First of all, yes, we should have done the reproductive history first, looking at illnesses, medication, and anabolic steroid use is obviously very common. And have, having received a patient this week again, uh, after having presented to, to the GP with low testosterone levels and given testosterone, which we all know what will happen. So when we have an abnormal sperm test, and yes, it's not, in, in, uh, it's not possible to refer all those pa patients to an accredited fertility clinic, but I would urge please to, whenever you send a man for a second semen analysis, to please have it done at an accredited fertility clinic. In terms of patients that end up with the diagnosis of azoospermia, I think it's also important those patients do go to the urologist for a diagnosis, which is not incorrect, but I think it's uh, not so nice for the man to come to the clinic with the report in his hand after having had a testis biopsy with the urologist to say, I do have sperm production in my testicles and we now have to do a second testis biopsy that we can obviously freeze and use in future ART cycles. So sometimes that it's better to have that first biopsy where you can freeze sperm. Just in terms of uh, the the semen. We obviously use the WHO reference values, and I think that is important to, especially the morphology, to have an accurate assessment because we use that to identify couples where they may be at risk of reduced fertilization or even failed uh, fertilization. And one thing never say never so whatever the sperm results say whatever the morphology is never say to a man you will never make your wife pregnant at home because otherwise he will knock on your door um, Yoshi has touched on fibroids i think uh, 
because it's such a common uh, condition, I want to say a little bit more about it. Um, obviously, we know it does affect uh, the reproductive, uh, cause a, a reproductive dysfunction in terms of the infertility as well as the recurrent pregnancy losses. But there's a little bit of conflict in the observational studies that we can see, and that is advanced age. So as patients become older, they are more likely to have fibroids, but as Yossi was also um, explaining, more likely to miscarry. So not all fibroids cause uh, recurrent miscarriages. And uh, I always say it's like buying a house. Position, position, position is very important. And yes, we use the classification. Some or other classification, there are many. But I think before you take a patient to theatre, you must know where that fibroid is and classify it. Submucosal fibroids, that's zero, ones, and twos, and uh, um, are the most important ones, obviously, affecting fertility. And all the others uh, we'll deal with a little bit later. So in terms of the medical treatment of fibroids, yes, we know that medical treatment does help with symptoms of fibroids, but obviously we can't use it when patients want to fall pregnant. And once you stop the treatment, obviously the symptoms may return. So surgery is obviously the uh, way to go. And that would be, first of all, hysteroscopically, we deal with submucosal fibroids, those type 1s, 0, 1s, and 2s, uh, through the hysteroscope. And just to mention the type 2s, there's a risk, and you have to tell your patient that you may not be able to remove the whole fibroid within one setting, uh, so that they are not surprised if you have to take it back to theater for a second procedure. In terms of energy source, we want to stay away from any electrocautery inside the uterus. There are mechanical uh, devices these days that uh, can treat in, uh, uh, fibroids beautifully without causing damage to the inside, causing the asherments and the recurrent miscarriages. In terms of whether to choose to do the surgery laparoscopically or via laparotomy. I think if you can't remove all the fibroids laparoscopically, then it's okay to do a laparotomy, but remove all the fibroids in one setting. We do get referrals where patients had one fibroid removed through a laparoscope, but none of the other fibroids attended to because it was technically too difficult. So also in terms of laparoscopy or laparotomy, the size of the fibroids, the number as well as the position can make you think whether you should rather do it as a laparotomy and as a rough guideline. If you have more than five fibro fibroids and the uterus is more than 17 weeks pregnancy size, you have to really think about doing a laparotomy. But obviously, there's a lot, of, a lot of variability among surgeons. So laparoscopy, later, laparotomy will be for all uh, other fibroids other than the submucosal ones that you dealt with hysteroscopically, and specifically <clears throat> those uh, submucosal ones that you can't treat uh, through the hysteroscope. Just a warning about the older patient. Um, that has got a fibroid and you are going to do it laparoscopically, um, there is always the very small risk, but real risk of a sarcoma. And then if you use a, mod mod a mor morselator, you can obviously upstage her disease. Um, some fibroids, you have to do a combined procedure between a, a hysteroscopic and laparoscopic procedure. And we would normally start first with the hysteroscopic one, because obviously once you've uh, um, operated from the top, you can't then do a hysteroscopy from the bottom. 
Uh, we also get patients referred for preventative treatment uh, of fibroids to improve their fertility, uh, the removal of asymptomatic or minimal symptomatic fibroids to improve fertility. Is, there's no proof that it makes a difference. And you do have the risk of new fibroid uh, formation, uh, which is a real risk. So you must always try and treat the fibroids as soon as possible before you are planning a pregnancy. Just in terms of uterine embryo, uh, uterine artery embolization, that is not routinely advocated in fertility, although there is some evidence of pregnancies um, post-treatment. And I think that is definitely an option, but only with specific indications. And that would be uh, patients that are at high risk of uh, doing surgery, uh, either abdominally or laparoscopically. For example, somebody with multiple previous uh, surgeries and a frozen pelvis, then after discussion with the patient, it may be an option. I want to spend a little bit of time on tubal factors, obviously because of our high HIV rate in South Africa, as well as pelvic inflammatory disease, we do get patients with um, um, tubal pathology that gets referred for, for treatment. I think that is uh, very important before you take a patient to theatre uh, to do a laparoscopy, you have to discuss with the patient potentially if you find a hydrosalpings. We do know that hydrosalpings will affect our IVF cycle embryo transfer, and obviously then we need to deal with the um, hydrosalpings at the, uh, the same time. But you have to have a discussion with the patient before whether they can afford uh, IVF ART because of the cost, uh, but we do get patients that had previous laparoscopies, uh, the, uh, both tubes, hydrosalpings, and then referred to the clinic for IVF, which we then have to re-operate. So just remember, um, have a discussion with your patient in terms of if you can't fix the tubes uh, um, when you operate, then maybe an HSG before is a good option. And if you see hydrosalpings, then rather refer for to a unit that can do tubal reanastomosis uh, if that is what the patient uh, uh, prefers. And then ovarian reserve. I think uh, I'm, I'm becoming a little bit obsessive about ovarian reser uh, reserve. And I think an increased awareness on the effects of aging on our patients, um, I think we have to uh, be more vocal about it uh, because our success of achieving a pregnancy in an ART cycle depends on a maximum yield of mature oocytes. And if you think about it, uh, of all the systems in the body, the reproductive system actually fail at a very relative young age with a peak efficiency in the mid-20s and then that steady decline as shown by Chris as well as uh, Yossi and obviously accelerated after the age of 35. So I really want to ask you as uh, um, gynecologists, you see the, um, the majority of the patients, uh, whenever you see a patient and they are still uh, looking at fertility options in future. Um, just think about the air quality and the quantity. And yes, the ovarian reserve tests, I think, come into the habit of doing antral follicle counts during your yearly visit um, to have an idea as to what this patient's ovarian reserve is. If you're not sure of the ov or the ovary is not quite visible or whatever, then maybe do an AMH blood test. And by doing that, you can identify patients 
for early referral to the clinic uh, because as I've said we can't make eggs in the clinic the only option for those patients will be donor eggs if they do not have a good ovarian reserve. That will also help patients to make the decision on fertility preservation, the social freezing of the eggs uh, that Chris also alluded to. And then, yeah, always think about uh, what you do in theater, anything that can reduce the egg quantity, those recurrent uh, procedures to the ovaries, um, the cyst formation, try and be conservative and minimize the risk of uh, causing um, egg damage. And I thank you. I think that's it. Thanks so much.